Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew and I'm a second semester Masters of Medical Physics student at EWA. Today I'll be presenting my proposal titled The Evaluation and Implementation of Total Skin Electron Therapy Techniques. I also like to take a moment to thank my supervisors, Dr. Pesh, uh, Dr. Pejman Roshan Fazad and Dr. Zaid Al Khatib. So, turtle skin electron therapy is used to treat mycosis fungoides, the most common form of T cell, uh, cutaneous T cell lymphomas. And so, this is initially located in the skin, forming patches and plaques, as well as cutaneous tumors, among other symptoms. At the moment, depending on the stage of the cancer, there's a variety of treatment methods available. These include skin-directed methods, such as UVB or corticosteroids, as well as systemic therapies like chemotherapy and immunotherapy. For interest in this project is total skin electron beam therapy. Um, so as the name suggests, we use a large electron beam with a field size of around 200 centimeters by 80 centimeters uh, to treat the whole skin basically in one uh, radiation. So electrons as a medium provides high skin dose and steep dose fall off, which allows us to treat the diseased area, which is the skin, highly effectively. So studies have shown, uh, such as Jones et al, that there's long-term progression-free survival possible for early stages, as well as complete remission rates of over 70% in stage four. Uh, despite that, in stage four, it is still palliative care only, but it is highly effective palliative care. There's also been a trend towards low dose uh, total skin electron therapy, which makes it repeatable with lesser toxicity, but similar emission rates. And so this brings us to objective one, to compare and evaluate the different techniques. So there's quite a number of different techniques and it's not uh, set per center in this per se. So I want to investigate and determine the dosimetric differences between these techniques. So for example, the underdosed areas and the overdosed areas, and also other practical factors, including positioning time, as well as comfort. Oh, not that we can measure it specifically at the moment. So this is based on the guidelines set by the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, or the EORTC. And so the points are listed there. For this project, I want to focus on the first three points. And so these are related to the radiation setup while the remaining points are due to the fractionation schedule. And so this project will purely be based around phantoms, and so we can't exactly test that fractionation schedule. And so let's discuss the main groups of treatment techniques. So the first main group and the most common is the modified Stanford technique. And so this involves six different positions as shown in the diagram on the right, and the patient is positioned in three uh, positions per fraction. So this typically has required a lot of time for positioning, but with high dose rate modes in modern Linux, uh, the treatment time is only 15 minutes. So it's not that significant of a difference. It is however, quite difficult to plan with phantoms and Monte Carlo. So again, that's due to the positions. Phantoms can approximate the dose for the torso, but the arms and uh, some areas of the legs are particularly difficult. That's the same for Monte Carlo, Virtual phantoms from CTs are typically either with their arms raised, and so remeshing that CT to make the positions is quite difficult, although it has been demonstrated with an approximation with cylinders in Monte Carlo, although it does take more work, and it's a fairly recent study. The next group would be the rotational technique. So patients stand on a rotating platform that rotates around three to four RPM, and this ensures even dosimetric uniformity, as well as a uh, good balance between patient comfort, so they're not too dizzy from spinning. And this does have reduced patient time uh, for positioning, as it's just a single position. Although again, with high dose rate modes, this is not too significant for the difference. And they have one or both arms raised above the head, and this gives a higher dose to the axilla or the armpits, but lower dose to the shoulder. So there have been a few studies already that have compared these two methods as the main groups of techniques. And so this includes Ding et al, which has done a Monte Carlo study. So they mainly compared it with a dose volume histogram, which is good at showing the general area of the volume, uh, sorry, surface area of the skin being treated, but it doesn't cover the exact local area differences. And being a Monte Carlo study, they found it difficult to do the stand positions and 
uh, did not include those. And so that would be a particular major difference between those two uh, techniques. So Miao et al, as mentioned earlier, did the cylinder approximation. And so in their study, they found larger lateral variations in Stanford techniques, but they weren't able to experimentally validate that. And so that's an area that we want to look at and uh, measure. There's also been a few in vivo dosimetry studies, and those show similar results to the Miao et al study, with flat surfaces equal to prescribed dose, while the tangential surfaces had larger variations. And this would be emphasized in larger patients. And so the last group of techniques is the reclined or lying down technique, or also known as the translational technique. I've left this for last because it has been reserved for non-ambulatory patients. So pediatric patients, uh, patients that aren't able to physically stand anymore, or anesthetized patients. And this is due to a lower dose uniformity, typically. And so, again, it's not used for standard patients. But it does offer some benefits, as it does not have any correlation to obesity index found, while the others do, uh, particularly because it's more of a standing position. Um, so significance. So first of all, we have to acknowledge the mycosis fungoides rate. And so that's with an extreme low incidence rate of only around 5.9 per million people in the USA. And out of those, not all require tilde skin electron therapy. Uh, despite this at the moment, Western Australia does not offer this treatment. And so patients require alternate methods or interstate travel. And so it's offered at Peter McCallan Cancer Center as well. Um, with these alternate methods, some of them, particularly UV, for example, are mainly used to treat the earlier stages and thus require more serious treatment methods, such as total skin electron therapy, for higher grades of cancer. But in particular, this study aims to address the treatment planning process as well. And so to increase that treatment planning and to more accurately personalize it. And so this is the second objective to solve that problem with 3D printed phantoms and personalized phantoms at that. Particularly in uh, total skin electron therapy, treatment planning has traditionally proved a challenge. So uh, most therapies can be just simulated with treatment planning systems, but this is not the case for total skin electron therapy due to the large SSDs and complex patient geometry. So you're looking at a range of around uh, three meters to seven meters for SSDs, and so that's a lot larger than a one meter uh, SSD, as well as the use of additional scattering um, plates as well to increase dose uniformity. Again, as mentioned before, it's difficult for phantoms to replicate, as well as being an uncommon treatment with high patient variance. So let's go further into this high patient variance. So there's been a correlation found for obesity index uh, with the Stanford technique, but we'd expect it to be the same for the rotational technique as well. And this is shown in dose to the inner thighs, the perineum, axilla, and top of the head. So particularly, um, as uh, Kapil has mentioned earlier, so electrons, when they enter at oblique angles, show much higher dose variance compared to photon beams. And so this is emphasized for uh, the total skin when we're dealing with a lot of side angles, but also with obese patients. So obese patients will have larger radiuses and thus lateral regions will be larger as well. And so the variations there are going to be more significant. Uh, we also have other factors such as the inframammary fold, which is the skin under the breast. So for those with pendulous breasts, that dose can differ by up to 40%. And so that's quite significant as well. So 3D printed custom phantoms shows the potential for better and more personalized treatment planning compared to commercial phantoms. And while these typically have been used for photon dosimetry studies, uh, it also has been shown for electron beams, which have shown higher accuracy compared to reference molded phantoms. In particular, I want to go over this study uh, done by Evans et al in 2016. So they had a patient and they had to treat with total skin electron therapy and they had to retreat again after he relapsed. And so during that time, he was treated with lying on the floor total skin electron therapy. They planned it first with a parallel plate ion chamber and solid water, then used a body factor, uh, which is the multiplicative factor calculated from the rando anthropomorphic phantom, which is quite commonly used in total skin electron therapy planning. So in the first fraction out of the three fractions, 
there in vivo dosimetry found the dose delivered was 78% of the prescribed dose. And so that is quite a significant dose difference. They further increased the dose by 10% in the second fraction and achieved 90% of the prescription dose. Again, they increased it by 15% to get finally 99% of the prescribed dose uh, for that fraction. So in total, they found a 28% discrepancy between their planned and their actual dose. And so that is quite a significant difference. So 15% of that, they or 15 out of that 28% was due to a patient specific body factor. So compared to the anthropomorphic phantom and the actual patient, they had a significant enough difference in body shape, uh, causing that 15% dose error. In addition, they the rest was due to setup variation. So they didn't include measurements of the physical body uh, specifications and planned it on the ground. And so again, when we have a full body phantom that's 3D printed, this will have the height and dimensions accurate to, uh, say, within a few centimeters and allow for better and more individual treatment planning, which is very important in total skin electron therapy. And so quickly on this 3D printed phantom design, uh, it will be based off a CT in our study, but for future studies uh, can be based on actual CTs rather than a CT library. The dosimeter of choice will be radiochromic film, and this allows for 2D dose mapping when necessary, but is also the most convenient. We also have ion chambers for organs at risk internally, although uh, for electron beams, we're not expecting much dose. This is primarily to measure the photon contamination from brimstrahling radiation. And it will also be flexible, which sets it apart from most commercial phantoms. And so not quite as flexible as the phantom on the uh, as the mannequin on the right, but at least partial flexibility to simulate such dose to underdosed areas. We can also test some of the technical specifications needed, such as the 80% dose at least four millimeters deep on the beam center axis. So this is typically measured in the torso, but we can also measure it in other further areas as well. And of course, putting film to measure typical underdose areas and perform validation of the lateral region variation in the Stanford technique discovered earlier. Um, this is the brief study design. It, the process would be quite simple, but it's a complex process. <laughs> so at the moment, we're in the proposal stage of just finishing all the research. And the next step would be the phantom construction. So to design, the, uh, obtain this phantom seat, sorry, obtain a CT of a patient from a fan, from a CT library or DICOM library, and then to design the cutouts and necessary shape for that phantom. Uh, construction, as well as gelatin filling for tissue equivalency, and then validation. So of course, most of the phantom and 3D printed work here has been with uh, photons, and so we need to validate that it's accurate for uh, electrons as well. And then of course, to expose it to different techniques, the comparison of dosimetric uniformity, and the final report. So here's a quick Gartt chart as well. And so you can see that we have measurements and analysis quite early to ensure that the validation is correct. Uh, realistically, this should be uh, even further up to account for the correct info and density needed for our PLA. And that's basically the references there. So thanks for listening and thanks for those that are still sticking around for this last presentation. Is there any questions? Thanks so much, Andrew. Any presentation? Any sorry, questions from Andrew? <coughs> Just a quick thing, Andrew. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. A good presentation. Just correct my uh, title. It's not don't put doctor because I don't have unless WA wants to give me a PhD. I don't mind. OK, but uh, <laughs> we happy to Sorry, give you a my professor. Apologies. Thanks a lot, Munir. Thanks. That's good. Yes. Uh, and you change the title, we'll give you uh, your... low marks. <laughs> uh, Andrew, here's you have a question? Yeah. yeah, really good presentation, Andrew. Um, that looks like a really cool project. I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, in terms of filling the phantom, so you're going to make a full, is it first of all, is it going to be a full adult body size phantom? Yeah, so the average patient, I think, is around 61 patient, 61 years old, and it's male. Okay. 
Um, and so you plan to fill the whole entire um, phantom with gelatin or? Yeah, so that's a interesting question. Ideally, yes, although yeah. it would be quite uh, troublesome, of course, right? With you dealing with a full patient and full phantom like that. Yeah. I feel like I would be able to get away. So the depth of the electron penetration would only be around right, three right, centimeters, right. four yeah. centimeters. Yeah. So to reduce yeah, weight and cost, it would be possible, I think, to do such a method like that. Of course, validating it first. Yeah. So you're saying you could like make a little shell of where it's actually filled, and then in the inside yeah. there's nothing because you won't get any dose there anyways, or it won't contribute yeah. whatsoever. That's, that's so point. I would need to validate that first, yeah. Um, and then the other thing's more just a remark. Maybe in terms of what you're actually feeling with the gelatin, there could be some investigation into different materials that have um, longer, um, how do you say, so, so it doesn't go off yeah. um, and <laughs> potentially become sticky by the end of it. Because I was just thinking afterwards if your phantom's going to be used routinely or not, I'm not sure, or if it's just going to be it's going to be stored somewhere. So also thinking as one more remark is yes, so to look into the particular type of filament you use to create the phantom. Because I know PLA is biodegradable, but I'm pretty sure it won't break down in a, in a short period, but maybe in a very long pe time period. So it could be another thing to look at. But yeah, really cool project and great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Keegan. Oh, thanks, Andrew. That was um, very good. Now, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask. You said Peter Mac do this. Is that the only Australian centre or are there a few Australian centres? It's been, I'm not exactly sure. So if anyone does know further, um, that would be helpful. I do know that Peter Mac does the rotational, but I'm not aware of other centres, although it's been hard to find specifically. Yes, I imagine so with such a, a rare disease. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you mentioned that when there's uh, rapid r radius changes and things like that. There's um, more unpredictable dose deposition, and that mm -hmm. also ties in with Kapil's work. Uh, do you know? Do, is the technique modified for that? Is it like expected to be like spot treatments on things like that, or is it more the sweeping averages out and that's how yeah, that goes? Yeah. So most centers, as far as the literature I've seen read, oh sorry, I've read has been concerned with, they don't. Um, it's mostly been ignored, I think, and so they mm -hmm. take it as it's mostly averaged out. They use boost treatments for, for example, the soles of the feet and the premium as well sometimes, but not for individual, like the deviations due to the inner thigh or, for example, such as that. Okay, so thank you. Uh, to answer your question, no, it's not typically varied. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Tegan. Any other questions from Andrew? I don't have a question. I just wanted oh, to say that was brilliant. Question. Thank you very much, Machine. Yes, but, this will, but this will require a lot of work, Andrew. It's not an yes. easy measurement. Just prepare yourself just to let you yeah. know. Thank you. Yes, just I want to note that's, that's a yeah, good time to stop soon because we've got a people. freely knack. Until the end of the year, yeah. And good luck. That's right. Excellent. You mean three new Linux for commissioning? Uh, the uh, one year? Uh, no, no. We now we having like a three machine available during the day until available. the end of the year. Oh, yes. Yeah, so it must be will be good idea for him to start as soon as he can. Because in okay. the future, it we might have more stuff and more patients, so we'll start it using 100%. Excellent. Brilliant. Brilliant. If there is no more questions, uh, just um, want to close. And I think Gabor, 